Let's just turn over Colorado's Amber Alert text system to political campaigns. Because while the campaigns bombard us with texts all time of day and night, the state can't seem to get missing child alerts to our cell phones like it should. It happened again last night. Our Marshal Zellinger went to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation to do some of his own. This is the Amber Alert that not all of you got at 827 last night. Then again, some of you, like me, got it multiple times. We want to learn these things because it is our goal to improve with each Amber Alert that we send out. For the second straight Amber Alert, the system did not work exactly the way CBI hopes it does. Sometimes it could be simply something like a character in the body of the email that we push out. CBI believes the error last night in some people not getting the text at all was a copy-paste issue. A character copied from a document did not paste in the correct format in the text system. CBI noticed something funny within 45 minutes, putting this message on Twitter that they're working with FEMA to address the issue because the system CBI uses to push out Amber Alerts is managed in part by FEMA. And CBI wants your feedback, like these tweets letting them know Jackie got the message four times, Lisa not at all. We sit down after each one and we look at the emails that we receive, the tweets that we receive, and we say, okay, this individual, this happened to this person and we look to identify that and really focus on what we can do to improve our alerts being pushed out. And you can manage how those alerts end up on your phone. In the settings of your iPhone, go to notifications and scroll all the way down. You can turn Amber Alerts on or off, but it's not recommended you disable them altogether. On the Samsung Galaxy, open your text messages, click the dots in the corner and choose settings. Here you can choose which type of emergency alerts you receive, meaning you can disable Amber Alerts altogether, or a better option, go back a page and either turn the sound on or off or the vibration on or off. Right now on 9news.com, we have an informal poll. Did you get that Amber Alert once, multiple times, or not at all? CBI actually tells me they're watching that poll, your tweets and emails for help to uh, guide the questions they'll have for FEMA and other providers in this system, Kyle. It's encouraging that they're at least open to input and they acknowledge there's an issue. Mm -hmm. All right, Marshall, thank you. Aurora is going to have a new mayor in a couple of hours. Council could select Timothy Hogan, son of the late mayor Steve Hogan, or they could choose one of their own, Councilman Bob Laguerre, to fill out Hogan's term. Or they could go with one of two former council members, Rennie Peterson or Debbie Hunter Holen. That meeting starts at 730. They're just going to vote and then swear in the newest leader of Colorado's third largest city. The human training wheels are coming off the A-line. More flaggers left their posts along crossings at 6 o'clock tonight. Chambers and Havana are now clear of those familiar, friendly faces. The issue with the crossing guard arms, they are finally fixed to the satisfaction of regulators. And hey, only took two years after the train to the plane opened. So now the flaggers move west to stand guard on the long-delayed G-line out to Wheat Ridge and Arvada as that goes through its testing process. Once all the A-line crossings are clear, that's when Denver and Aurora can ask for official permission to turn off those, the train horns, and finally provide the peace and quiet that was promised long ago. And remember, ain't no party like an A-line party because an A-line party don't stop unless the train breaks down again. A reminder of our old promise when the A-line gets that final all clear, and it looks like it will be soon, I will be on board the train wearing that. The president's spokeswoman got refused service at a restaurant over the weekend. His immigration point person was heckled out of a movie theater. Here in Colorado, we have seen evening protests right outside the homes of Denver's Democratic District Attorney and Colorado's Republican Senator. So I sat down today with two unconventional political thinkers for a conversation about these increasingly personal protests. I want to talk about what this might mean for politics and kind of society more generally. So I'm joined by Ross Kaminsky, libertarian talk show host on 630 KHOW, and Elizabeth Epps, who's a progressive legal advocate with the Denver Justice Project. Elizabeth, is this effective? Why are they effective? Is they're getting people having these conversations about what should be comfortable and what shouldn't. And a lot of folks, myself included, think that a country like ours that doesn't provide a a guaranteed right to an education or a guaranteed right to clean water, that folks who are in an administration that is okay with those things not being rights would assert that someone has a right to a peaceful dinner is a little bit laughable. It's the most effective thing that could be done to help Republicans. It's, uh, it's really remarkably short-sighted on the part of the far left to just show themselves as, as petty and angry and, and really willing to make politics 
more personal than I think most Americans want it to be. The idea that confronting someone in a place where they think safe, a person who is actively committing and perpetrating a harm, that confronting them on it is petty, is problematic to me. It's calling for people to not stand up for their own rights. And you don't get to be in a position of power and dictate how those without the power assert their own power. That, that's not how any of this works. I am not saying don't make people uncomfortable. No, no, uh, I agree I'm with all for this, a protest. the definition of this event. Uh, You're I, not. I am. I'm and just as long as it doesn't make people too uncomfortable. That's not true. I'm just not for harassing them at dinner. There were lots and lots of people in this country, in, including me, and I'm not a conservative and I'm not a Republican, who thought that what the Obama administration was doing to this country in a whole range of areas was incredibly harmful. And I, it never would have occurred to me to go harass somebody who works for Barack Obama because I don't like the administration's policies. I think we're back where we started. We're going to leave it there. Ross and Elizabeth, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Ross and Elizabeth got rolling. That was a portion of our 30-minute conversation. You can see the whole thing on the next YouTube channel, youtube.com slash next on 9 News. Our next question comes from a viewer named Pete. Kyle, since we're being inundated with political advertising, when will we know who will be the final candidates for governor? Pete, my man, tomorrow night is the night. The votes will finally be counted. The two nominees, Democrat and Republican, will be announced. But you know those, those ads won't stop, though. They just go from touting and trashing a field of eight candidates for governor to a field of two. Let's continue to talk politics, honestly. So all the talk was that unaffiliated voters included in party primaries in Colorado for the very first time this year, that they would be a moderating influence. Well, you know what? Maybe not. Here's politics guy Brandon Ritterman. Unaffiliated voters are 37% of Colorado's electorate, outnumbering Republicans or Democrats. But they're only 23% of the turnout in the primary as of this morning. They are going to make a bigger impact on the Democratic side because more of them identify as liberal. In a recent survey of unaffiliated voters, 42% say they tend to vote for Democrats. Only 16% said they tend to vote Republican. 30% say they vote for both parties about 50-50. The biggest issues for these voters, health care and public education, followed by the economy and the environment. So I'm a proud member of Colorado's most popular political party choice. None of the above. I'm unaffiliated. And all of us who are have the choice whether to vote in a party primary tomorrow. Our ballot selection, though, is a public record. I really wrestled with this choice before throwing both of my ballots in the trash this weekend. So did political reporter Brandon Ritterman, though. I respectfully disagree with Brandon's view that political journalists should not vote in primaries in order to preserve their neutrality. There are some journalists who don't vote at all for the exact same reason, but I personally don't think the journalists need to give up their rights as Americans. And here's why I think that you can vote in a party primary without being partisan. If you live in Denver, the real decisions are made on the Democratic primary ballot. If you live in Douglas County, well then the Republican primary is where the races are won. Even if you don't agree with the dominant party in your neighborhood, there's a really good argument that you should be voting in their primaries just so you have a voice. But ultimately, I decided not to vote in a party primary this year, mostly because I didn't want anybody to be able to question the work of this TV station and of my colleagues because of my decision. And in the end, it was actually a lot like voting. I'm not sure that I made the right choice, but I think I thought it through for the right reasons. The most Colorado thing we saw today is making me thirsty. And stay hydrated, my friends. We are headed to 100 in June for the first time in five years. Then the not-so-mysterious case of the wanted man who commented on his Facebook mugshot. That's next. Colorado thing we saw today is one of our neighbors telling Colorado's latest hailstorm, hold my beer. No, really, Storm, I need you to hold my beer and I need you to keep it cold for me. Christina Billingsley knew when the mountains turn blue, that hail bucket's done its job. This almost earned our most Colorado honors for the day. It is a rolling tribute to the beauty of our state, spotted by our Chris Hansen while he was stuck in traffic up in Silverthorne. <laughs> Hello, 
slow first week of summer. If you got rain yesterday, I hope you enjoyed it because we are looking at hot highs in the 90s, close to 100 degrees on more than one day. The storm that brought the rain, wind and hail is well off to the east of us now, creating a severe weather threat across about seven states. As that low shifts east, high pressure sets up. And what that means is the storm track will stay north of us for the next five, maybe seven days. The high today at 82 is just shy of the average, but we're actually headed into record territory come the middle of the week. Warm, dry, stable layer of air over the area, so very little in the way of cloud cover, let alone clouds that might bring rain, thunder, or lightning. Good radiational cooling tonight, so overnight minimums will be very mild as well. As a matter of fact, temperatures tonight will be close to 60 in the city, which is where we start tomorrow morning, but are high at 95. The middle of the week, a record high possible. Could see 100 degrees on Thursday. The record is 99. A little cooler for the weekend with a better chance of rain from storms on Sunday. And right now, if you're having issues with the allergies right now, it looks as though the trees are the worst culprit right now, Kyle. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Tristan Brown, give it up, man. It's over. Del Norte Police, I mean, they got your mugshot there on the Facebook page. Everybody's seen it, and I know you've seen it because you commented on the post, man. Not the best move telling the PD that's blanked up. They're after you. See, they commented. They just asked you to come in. But you do you, Tristan. You check back with Del Norte Police. He has not come in to clear up his outstanding warrant. That story sparked a note from Bruce Brown, who was watching next the other day, and, and said that I mispronounced Del Norte. Bruce insisted that the pronunciation is Del Norte. Well, Bruce, this is one that we already tackled on an episode of What Do You Say? when we called the town administrator and asked her the question. The way we pronounce it is Del Norte. Some of the older generation of the local town town do say Del Norte, but mostly the younger generation have always just called it Del Norte. If you were ever looking to settle a bet on a pronunciation of a Colorado place, you should check out the big story that we have up in the next section of 9news.com that has every single pronunciation that we have sorted out so far here on Next. Use it to win some bets with your friends. And if there's a city or a town or a mountain range or a river, something that you've heard multiple pronunciations of, we'll get to the bottom of it. Email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. When we return, we meet a man who prompted the question, that's a job? Next. many of our neighbors have made careers out of unlikely occupations. When we heard Steve Kraft spent 30 years sharpening scissors and such, we thought, that's a job? Sewing really nice, balanced tension, nice and even, so it's ready to go. So what are you looking for? On the tension, if it's not balanced right, you end up getting a really loose stitch um, that you can't really control by adjusting the tension higher on the top. Hi, my name's Steve Kraft. I'm a sewing machine technician. Well, every time I ask or tell somebody what I do for a living, they're like, do people still sew? I get that so often, and thank goodness they still do, and all these different things are out to keep people sewing, because um, I want to keep this up. It's been a great job, and I, I just see no reason to ever stop. So when this machine came in for an estimate, they just needed it to be serviced, but I always go over it and double check the tension on the machine. Um, I can tell by feel about where this needs to be, and if it needs to be adjusted, I adjust it here. Then coming into the machine, when I'm gonna service it, you pull all the covers off, eventually this will all be pulled apart. But I get internally, and I've got canned air that I use to blow the machine out. I use also a fine brush to clean everything out. 
this. Fine. I've I've just loved doing this over the years so much because it's just it's a direct reward when I'm finished with the machine. If I don't get it to sew right and do right, I don't charge the customer. I want to make sure that uh, it's coming out perfect. Yeah. I ended up fixing the winder clutch here. This wasn't disengaging right, right. to do the winder, right. so that's functioning. But I just wanted to show you the tension. And I've got it set right at about four. Okay. So keep it there. And if you get any loose stitches, slightly loose on the bottom of the fabric, then mm -hmm. go higher with the numbers. So it took many years to get good at it, um, but it's been a great career. I really love doing it. Steve has a workshop inside Colorado Fabrics off Parker Road in Aurora. He's been working there 10 years. We continue our search for the oddest occupation in Colorado. Don't you think they always seem to be held by interesting people, too? They're always really passionate. We welcome your ideas. Email next at 9news.com or give us a shout with the hashtag HeyNext. So Carol Geisler sent me this Facebook message this afternoon and said, Kyle, since you started the segment about bad parking, my husband now feels it's his job to point out every lousy parking job anywhere we go. Carol, call your husband into the room. You've crossed a line and your feedback next. our most popular segment lately would be the polite parking shaming of you've crossed a line. You ever look at somebody's parked vehicle and think, yeah, I know that guy. I know all about that guy. Nice truck, not so nice of a way to park. Leave a space for somebody else. Would you June Goddard spotted this at Southlands Mall in Aurora? It's a sign that seems to indicate that you need to pull some kind of fast and furious move while you are driving in downtown Denver. How exactly would you even execute that in traffic? Benjamin Page found what looks to be a reverse U-turn sign. Denver Public Works was stumped on this as well. They think that maybe somebody just put it in upside down. I almost want to go out there and just watch drivers attempt it. If you see a sign that makes you do a double take, email next at 9news.com or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. Colleen writes in and says, I understand your perspective sitting out the primaries, but as others have mentioned, your profession is second to your citizenship. It is a secret ballot, after all. You can vote and not tell anybody who you voted for. I understand that, Colleen, but don't forget, if you're an unaffiliated voter, when you pick the Republican or Democratic primary ballot, that choice is public record. People can find out. They could find out if I made that choice, and I just don't want it to reflect poorly on anybody else around here. Chris writes in, love the show. I still follow you from Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. Enjoy the sunshine, Chris. See you next time.